Hi everyone. I think I think uh, we can get we can get started. Um, we can get started now. I just want to welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar, and I want to thank first of all thank you all for joining. This is of course especially for those in the United States or those outside the United States paying attention to what's going on in the United States. It's a pretty crazy time uh, of the calendar year. Uh, not simply COVID, but of course the U.S. elections. Uh, so I really appreciate all of you uh, joining us, <clears throat> joining us today. So thank you, and I want to also thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for its support of this and other events uh, through BCARS, the Boston Consortium for Arab Region Studies, which I direct, and also of course our university, our host university, Northeastern University, and particularly our College of Social Sciences and Humanities. As you know, our pre pre presenter today is Dr. Bengi Gumrukju, a visiting scholar and lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Rutgers University. Dr. Gumrukju received her PhD in political science from the University of Zurich after earning both a BA and MA in public uh, administration. In 2018, uh, Bengi was a visiting fellow at the European University Institute in Florence and before that was a researcher in the sociology department at the University of Paris. She has another, uh, uh, she has a number of other appointments um, in, her, in her career. And she's the author of a number of peer reviewed articles, book chapters, and has a forthcoming book with Rutledge that's entitled Protest and Politics in Turkey in the 1970s, The Making of a Protest Wave. Of course, we're gonna be hearing I'm sure quite a bit, a bit about that, given given the title of uh, her presentation today. Let me also introduce now, but he'll be speaking after um, after Dr. Uh, Gumrukju, um, and that is our discussant, uh, Dr. Haider Darija, a postdoctoral fellow in the School of International Service at the American University in Washington. Uh, Dr. Darija. Uh, earned his PhD in anthropology and history from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. This is where I'm obligated as a Michigan alum myself to say go blue. And I don't mean this in relation to the election next week, but if you wanna to jump to that, go for it. Uh, but uh, as a fellow Michigander, I have to, uh, have to sing that out when I can. Dr. Dirija's research focuses on youth politics of resistance in Kurdistan. And he has, a, again, has a number of articles and book chapters and a co-authored book of his own. And as I say, we'll be hearing from him after our presenter. Uh, and so it's my pleasure, uh, and of course, Val Mogadam, Professor Val Dantin Mogadam, my, my friend and my colleague at Northeastern, she'll be co-moderating this with me. Uh, as you, again, probably all know, Professor Mogadam's areas of research are extensive, uh, focusing on globalization, revolutions, social movements, transnational feminist networks, gender development and democratization in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, if I started to go through her, TV will be here all night, so I'll, I'll leave it. And again, I'll just say now, let us turn uh, this discussion over to our friend uh, and, and colleague, Dr. Bengi Bumrukju. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Bengi. Um, no, thank you for having me and inviting me to give this talk, which is very exciting for me. And I would like to start by um, sending my best wishes to the whole Asian region, which is affected from the devastating earthquake today. Uh, I'm from Izmir, so right, my heart is now right there, uh, even though I'm in New Jersey. And I would like to thank everyone who has joined us today, uh, even if it means, you know, moving from one room of your house to another during the COVID situation. So thanks for coming. And again, I would like to thank uh, Professor Sullivan, Mokhadam, and uh, Dariji for their, you know, contributions and to the Northeastern University for organizing this. So I guess I can start, right? Please do. Um, yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> can you see my um, yes. screen? Okay. So actually, I'm not going to talk about a paper today, but I'm going to try to bring together my, um, you know, ideas which are like floating around, so to speak, and which are, um, which I'm trying to work on these days. So it's not only one paper, but it's like a combination of my ideas coming from different papers that are work in progress right now. So let me start. Um, as you are, you know, like 
most probably a very rough starting in late May um, and lasting around like three months, Gezi Park protests um, shook Turkey for many reasons, including being one of the largest ways uh, of protest and bringing together a variety of actors from ranging from political parties to barely organized platforms, and obviously individuals of different socioeconomic and political backgrounds, uh, from the anti-capitalist Muslims to the right-wing and the far-left political organizations. The protest att attracted a lot of uh, you know, attention from the public, but as well as from the national and inter international media, uh, and from the academic community, which was, um, I, I can say, I guess, which was not really engaged in social movements research up until then. But obviously the Gezi Park protests, um, you know, even though they were referred as um, something new in the political history of Turkey, we can not say that it was, you know, like the first ever um, large wave of protests in Turkey. This is one of my points actually that I'm trying to make in, in a work um, in progress right now. So as, as I said, the Gezi Park protests, even though they are really important in, in our you know, like contemporary history in Turkey, these were not the first large wave of protests in the country. By the 1960s, we know that the students in Turkey, as in many other countries, were demonstrating on the streets, uh, raising their demands, which were initially related to the university administrations. Uh, and then, you know, like asking for um, new rights and they were demanding access to the decision making processes. They were demanding sometimes a revolution and they started to appear in the streets employing um, direct confrontational as well as violent collective action. So, so like we can say that while the protests in Turkey started in a peaceful environment, they entered in a new and extremely violent phase, especially in the in the second half of the 1970s, and this wave of protests lasted until the military coup in 1960. And in contrast to, to the similar wave of protests uh, in Western Europe, the protests in Turkey in that time, um, they did not help to consolidate Turkey's weak democracy. On the contrary, uh, a military regime was established after the 19, 1980 coup, which lasted until the general elections in 1983. So in, in this regard, uh, I'm also claiming that Turkey, you know, is not a movement society because um, the protests have not overall become a normal part of political life or political engagement. Not back in the 70s and not even today. And one reason I believe is the legacy of the pre-1980 mobilization and the coup period that, that followed um, and the the collective memory that have uh, established, so to speak. So because of the wounds of these years that are not scabbing, according to Ergudan, for example, what happened in the 1970s is still an important part of the political agenda, and it frequently becomes uh, an issue in the news and the media. Because this period was considered as a period of chaos, um, they are usually and frequently referred to during periods of unrest and protest and clashes, especially in the universities in the recent times. So for example, if there is a, you know, like a clash going on in a, in a university, we are hearing these comments from the politicians or from the media. Are we going back to the pre-1980 period? Um, so the legacy of that decade and the military junta I'm claiming in my book, which is hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, forthcoming soon. Um, the legacy of that decade and the military junta that ruled for three years after the coup changed the nature of the political in Turkish politics. So what I'm trying to do in, in, in my forthcoming book um, and in several work under progress, um, I'm considering the 1970s and the Gezi Park protest as a cycle of wave. And I'm arguing first that there is a continuity rather than a rupture between these various waves of protests, not only with the 1970s, but also with the uh, global justice movement of the early 2000s. Um, and with regards to the 1970s and the Gezi Park protests, <coughs> sorry, 
even these two waves are, you know, like, seeming so distant by analyzing the actors and forms of actions used by the protesters and the repression by the state, uh, we can see that there are a lot of similarities actually. And secondly, uh, we know that de delegitimizing the civil society is listed as an authoritarian innovation in the Eastern European context. Um, given that Turkey's backsliding into an authoritarian regime started before the Eastern European countries, I'm claiming that um, these regimes are not only delegitimizing the existing civil society, departing from the Turkish case, obviously, but also they attempt to take over this realm. And thirdly, in relation to the second point, I'm suggesting that the field of contentious politics and state repression, uh, which is somehow neglected by some scholars who work on democratic backsliding in Turkey can actually be used be a useful tool to discuss Turkey's recent de-democratization or uh, populist authoritarian turn or whatever term you want to use. So as you might understand, I'm theoretically uh, basing my work on the literature on contentious politics and adopting the concepts such as protest, uh, cycle of um, protest itself or cycle or wave of protest, repression uh, and protest civil spill of over from the contentious politics um, realm. So let me briefly talk about um, the concept of repression that I'm going to use here and the, the forms of repression that I will be talking about. Uh, repression in the literature is accepted as a dimension of the political opportunity structure. Uh, and it is defined by Tilly as any action by another group which raises the contender's cost of collective action. So given this, you know, like broad definition provided by Tilly, we can say that um, repression may take several forms varying from direct police action during protest events to surveillance, uh, from military suppression of the protest events to restrictions of free speech and assembly, and from arrests to, to the disappearance of, of participants. So um, in this regard, we can actually, you know, like make some classifications or distinctions between different types of um, or sources of repression. And I'm going to use um, the, the classification by proposed by Jennifer Earl, um, and where she's making a three common three common distinctions with regards to the repression. So first, she's talking about um, overt and covert repression. Uh, she is distinguishing between coercion and channeling, and then she is distinguishing between state and non-state um, sources of repression. And obviously, when she is proposing these distinctions, she is not claiming that you know, like these are separate and mutually exclusive uh, categories. But, but rather, we can see that you know, like both state and non-state actors might employ covert and overt coercion or channeling. And I pro for, provided some examples here uh, of each type of, you know, like repression, but I'm not going to go into the details of it because of, um, because of time limits. So this was, you know, like the theoretical background with regards to my contentious politics uh, theory. And with regards to the second point that I'm, you know, like my second argument, uh, I'm also, you know, like making benefit of Tilly's work where he's generally arguing that the government's response to the dissent would roughly correspond to the distinct type of government. So in this regard, repressive governments are obviously um, or not obviously, but you know, like can be categorized as, as authoritarian in nature. Uh, and finally, I'm also making benefit of the recent, uh, recently growing literature on the relationship between populist authoritarianism and social movements in order to, you know, like develop my third point, um, because this, this literature, literature is suggesting concepts like political theater, uh, which is used by Kotwas and Kubik, for example, um, and they're referring to the political theater as the time when the authorities are mobilizing their supporters. And this is actually causing the 
the thickening of the thin ideology of populism, thus in turn facilitating the passage to populist authoritarian regimes. So before going into the details of, of the 1970s and the Gezi Park protests as as waves of protests, I wanted to show you some, some graphs which are quite striking for me. And this one is showing us the development of various aspects of democracy in Turkey since the 1970s and the data is belonging to varieties of democracy project. And it is striking here that the level of democracy uh, in the country today is somewhat similar to, to the early 1980s when the country was under the rule of uh, military junta. And here again, we are seeing um, the level of institutionalized autocracy in, in Turkey from the 1970s. Again, the data is belonging to varieties of democracy. And we are seeing that this variable today is again similar to the level of the early 1970s, uh, which, was a, which was a period followed by a memorandum and uh, ruled by technocratic government until 1973. So now let me turn to the waves of protests of the 1970s and, and 2000s. And here I would like to share another graph here, which is revealing um, that, you know, we can actually talk about two major waves of protests in Turkey's recent history. Uh, one is starting in the 1970s, mid 1970s, and the other one is the, the, the period of Gezi Park protests. And I wanted to in, you are seeing this, you know, like red square, right, on the graph, uh, which is showing the period that I've worked intensely on my, uh, during my dissertation. And uh, I have reviewed some newspapers from, from Turkey for the time, and I've coded every other article, which is informing some which is including some information about the protests, and I came up with an original data set of more than 5,000 protest events that happened in Turkey from 1971 till 1986. So in, in this wave of protests of the 1970s, the students were the early risers of, of, the, of the wave. And this was also the case for countries like Italy and Germany, for example, as we know from Della Porta's work. So active from the 1960s onwards, the students were engaging in protests for improvements in the conditions of the universities uh, against unpopular teachers, shortages of books, and, uh, and, the, and the, you know, like prices of food in the university canteens or the quality of the food in the university canteens. But they also held protests about international developments, such as the Vietnam uh, Vietnam War and the Chinese Revolution. Um, and they, you know, like they sometimes protested um, the situation in, in the Arab Israeli uh, conflict. They also protested about the existence of the US military bases in Turkey. So we can say that the 1970s was a period when the left wing, especially the left wing students, were getting more empowered, uh, especially with, with the, you know, like um, institutional structure as in the case of the 1961 constitution, which provided a lot of rights to, not to the students, but also to labor. So this kind of, you know, like uh, triggered the political right and the right wing students also started to organize around uh, organizations like the, the, the National Turkish Students Union or the Idealist Hearts. So we know from, you know, like some of the historical work and some of the trial cases that the far right nationalist idealist youth, they were trained in commando camps uh, and there was an increasing militancy among the uh, right wing students. So this, this eventually led to some clashes between students coming from different uh, ideological backgrounds which led to severe clashes between right wing and left wing, you know, like broader groups. Uh, and this, these clashes actually became um, a part of the daily routine, unfortunately. 
So as you see from here, uh, from the table, the workers along with the students were also one of the main groups protesting uh, on the streets in the 1970s, especially after the 1960 military coup and the introduction of the new constitution and the new laws regarding the labor, which provided a space uh, for ideological politics, the labor activities spread in the 1960s. Several developments such as um, rapid industrialization and social change in those years, um, weak coalition governments, the formation of the Turkish Labour Party, uh, as well as growing working class awareness thanks to some, um, some translations as well, translations of books that are important for, for their cause, they caused openings in the political opportunity structure for, uh, for Labour's mobilization. So what kinds of forms of actions were used in the decade? So I'm, here you are seeing um, the general classification of the forms of actions in the literature. So this might be a little bit vague, but we can talk about it uh, in the Q&A if you are more interested in that. Um, so as you see, there are various numbers of um, forms of actions used. But again, what is obvious is that the decade was marked with um, sorry, mass use of violence as more than, you know, like 70% of all the protest events that I quoted were including some sort of violence. So this is actually why the period is labeled as a dark uh, era, both in the, in, the, in the media and in the political discourse. And maybe this is one of the reasons uh, that we neglected the decade academically as well. But I'm, what I'm trying to do in the book uh, is to, you know, like, is to dig uh, a little bit deeper to have a more detailed analysis of the period. And I, I don't want us to be blinded by violence. Uh, and I want us to have a closer look on the different forms of actions used in the period, because there are a lot of, you know, like, um, symbolic or demonstrative forms of actions that are used as well. Um, so, um, with regards to the students, for example, we are seeing that, um, as I told, you know, like their main concerns were related to demanding more participation to the decision making processes in their universities, but also in the, you know, political, broader political arena. So, for these kind of issues, we are seeing that the students resorted more to confrontational forms of protest, such as boycotting the classes, occupying some administrative buildings in the campuses. They also heavily uh, consulted to forums, um, and they were in these forums. They were coming together to discuss issues on several occasions, including the dismissal of their friends and teachers, and about the presence of of the police forces in the universities. And as we all know, I guess, this form of action became popular again, especially during, during and after the Gezi Park protests in Turkey in the summer of 2013, as people started to you know, organize forums in, in public parks. But it's also possible to observe more symbolic forms of actions in those years, such as silent marches, especially after, after the death of a you know, friend. Uh, or use of politicians' muppets, um, establishing tents in the yards of the university campuses, um, placing black rats, uh, keeping a minute in silence, and um, you know, like many other symbolic actions. And as I've mentioned, you know, like as as students, they also. Um, occupied, especially the university buildings. And I, I want to underline one thing here because this is going to link us to, uh, to the Gezi Park protests. Um, back in the, in the 1960s and 70s, the occupiers of the universities, right? Like the students, they were establishing an alternative life and turned these places into an educational space where they were, you know, like reading books together and they were debating about like their ideas. So they were kind of, you know, like trying to protect their living spaces um, with, with these occupations. At the same time, the university under occupation became a space where free campuses are created, um, so to speak. 
So let me jump to fast forward to, to the Geza Park protests. Um, I guess, you know, like everyone is more familiar with this with the story here. Um, in, in late May 2013, a group of about like 20 people gathered to get together uh, in Geza Park in Taksim, Istanbul, to resist the uprooting of the trees in this central area. And they started a camp in the park, actually. Um, but let me let me say that this um, this uprooting of, of the trees from the park was actually a part of a long uh, going project of renovation of the Texan Square, which uh, which was you know like the project itself was aimed to open opening the center of the city, uh, which had actually a significant importance and memories uh, due to the bloody May Day demonstrations, especially in, in 1977 to the global and national finance. Uh, and this project was actually creating already an opposition. For example, the group Taxim Solidarity uh, played a crucial role during and after the protests. And it was founded already in 2012. So in the very, very early hours of, uh, of May 29, 2013, the police intervened to the protesters for the first time and uh, for the second time on the next day. So when the news uh, spread on social media that these Occupy style protesters had been brutally attacked by, by the Istanbul police uh, in, the hour, in the early hours uh, of the day, um, actually like far greater numbers of protesters or people joined them in the park. So mass protests erupted after this, and it is quite difficult to detect when the protests ended, but we can claim that they lasted until the end of summer 2013 with some, you know, like ups and downs from time to time. And with regards to, um, with regards to the actors of the Geza Park protests, um, thanks to some several surveys, we know, uh, we know some background. According to the results of Conda uh, survey, for example, the around like 50% of the participants were women. Uh, the age average was uh, 28 and more than half of the participants had a university degree. And about like 40% of the, the protesters were students. Another interesting point I would like to underline here is that um, only about like 22% of the participants were organized in civil society or, or in a political party. While the participants were not organized, uh, they still had some you know, experience in, in collective action. Because according to Conda's survey, more than 55% of the participants reported that they participated in a demonstration petition or a protest event. And for about half of the participants, the police repression towards the first group of protesters uh, was actually the reason they attended the protests. Um, so what kind of forms of actions were employed by these protesters? During Gezi Park protests, we have witnessed the use of a wide range of forms of actions, varying from demonstrations to barricades, uh, wall writings to concerts and theater performances, from sit-ins to standing men and women protests, and the use of some, you know, like distinguishing and identifying slogans such as everywhere Taksim and everywhere solidarity. Um, so in, in Istanbul, we know that um, protesters set up a sophisticated encampment area uh, where money was not in use uh, and it was called as the Taksim commune. So it came to provide, this commune came to provide food, medical care, market stalls and books for people who were involved in the protests. So when we look at the literature about Geza Park protest, actually this scale of en encampment an experience of uh, com communal life was probably one of the distinguishing features of the protests in the history of uh, social movements in Turkey. But I would like to underline that um, Turkey's labor movement um, in, 
in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, they introduced the encampments uh, on a larger scale um, to the repertoires of action uh, of, you know, like movements in Turkey. So in mid-December 2009, spilling to 2010, 10, uh, hundreds of Tekel factory workers came to Ankara to, pro to protest the privatization of the institution. And then they, you know, like set up um, tents here and they established a resistance street as they call it. So it emerged as around uh, 500 workers from around Turkey came to Ankara to the capital of country and they refused to leave and then set up handmade tents to protect themselves from the cold and to sleep in, in there. So another, you know, like novelty, novelty during the Gezi Park protests is claimed to be the extensive use of um, humor during, during this period. But we can say that, you know, I mean, there were really some interesting slogans, for example, some, some protesters used or said, you know, like, that's it, uh, I'm calling the police when they were facing the police, actually. And uh, they, you know, like made references to the popular culture, winter is coming, for example, you know, like making a reference to the Game of Thrones, or you are messing with the wrong generation uh, who, you know, like beats cops in the GTA, a reference to the Grand Theft Auto, if I'm not mistaken, which is a video game. However, we can actually see that um, those people who were at Gezi Park protests, um, they were already familiarized with the humorous language of, uh, of, of the society or more maybe, you know, like the left-wing uh, groups with the satiricals such as Gurgur, Lemon, Penguin and, and others. Um, as I said, you know, like there were, uh, there were also some standing men protests, as you see here, um, which was actually started by this um, guy whose, whose name is Erdem, if I remember well. And I recently learned that he was a student of Rutgers, actually. So he, you know, like uh, went to the Taksim Square and just stood there um, without doing anything. And these kind of, you know, like forms of action became popular among, among the protesters. So um, they also used, you know, like casserole protests, which were again used in Turkey in the 1990s, but they were initiated in the 1970s in, in Chile. And after the clearing of the Gezi Park uh, um, park in the, in the, you know, like Taksim Square, the police, um, by the police uh, in June 15th and 16th, the protesters started to organize public forums um, in several parks ex across the districts of Istanbul, as well as in other provinces of Turkey, including Ankara and, and um, Izmir. So maybe, you know, like one final word about uh, the protesters. This is, these are two pictures that I like, um, because actually it's, the one on the left-hand side is, uh, is from the 1970s and it's taken in Izmir. Uh, and the, the left one, the one on the left is from Istanbul during Gezi Park protests. And the banners that you are seeing, you know, like hang around these buildings are actually representing various um, organizations of, of the left or the far, far left. So we can say that um, not only some, you know, like forms of actions that are continuous, but also the fractionalized structure of the left wing is, is a continuous um, thing from the 19. Uh, 70s. And now let me show you two pictures from Mayday demonstrations respectively in 1976 and 2018. Um, and, and we see from the pictures that, you know, like these Mayday celebrations were held under significant police existence and surveillance. So I actually believe that, you know, like these two, gra the, the graphs that I've showed you before about um, the similarities between, you know, like 70s and 80s and today. And these two pictures are telling us so much about the continuities and the similarities in the country in terms of um, contentious politics uh, and, and repression. So um, 
let me now turn to repression and I'm trying to, I'm going to try to, you know, like be quick in, in providing you some details about the repressive acts um, that we see in Turkey, both in 1970s and in current day. First, we can talk about policing, right? Like, which is uh, the main form of repression that is also handled in, in the literature, but policing might also take different, different forms, I would say. Uh, we can talk about like, the police presence itself is a as a form of coercive, uh, not coercive maybe as in the case of presence, but you know like over repression, because it's kind of you know like telling the people that the protests are interrupting the daily life, uh, and they are also you know like giving the image of uh, of an emergency rule or something extraordinary is going on. So that's they are actually marginalizing uh, the protests. On the other hand, we know that you know, like the police might intervene in in protests uh, and detain protesters, but we also know that policing might take the form of police violence. Um, and according to the Chamber of Doctors of Ankara, for example, in 2013, police violence um, was was one of the um, significant threats against public health in the country. Besides policing, we can also say that, you know, like the attitudes towards the street protests have not changed in Turkey uh, since the 1970s. There is actually a continuity in how governments have handled uh, such protests. In response to the student mobilization during the late 1960s, for example, the then Prime Minister Suleyman Demiral said that the roads are not worn out by walking, kind of, you know, like delegitimizing uh, the protests going on. Sorry, just a second. Um, and and we, we have seen that uh, Erdogan repeated these words in 2017 in response to, to the justice march organized by the main opposition party. So in, in addition, uh, there are also some, you know, like works showing us that the state uh, suppressed the, the majority of the students and the labor or, and the labor protests uh, between 1994 and, you know, like um, in, to, in 2000s. Uh, again, you know, like during a rally in 2011, Erdogan stated that politics cannot be done on the streets, kind of, you know, like delegitimizing the protests themselves and, and the protesters and denying um, protesting as a normal way of doing politics or engaging in politics. And um, next we can talk about the mobilization of law uh, or legal repression according to some scholars uh, as a covered channeling form of repression. Uh, and in, in the case of Turkey, we can talk about the, special, the case of the special courts, which were highly active under the name of state security courts in the 1970s and 80s. And according to some, some scholars, they were kind of providing a fast track for trying political opponents. While these um, courts were, you know, like abolished by the ruling AKP today, um, they, they were replaced by some special authority courts and then heavy panel courts, which took over uh, the Gezi Park case, for example, trialing the Gezi Park protesters. And then we can uh, talk about the state of emergency as a covered uh, channeling type of repression. Um, and, you know, like the, after the 19 military, 1980 military coup, um, an emergency rule was declared and it established uh, emergency rule governors, governors all around um, the country. And the emergency rule was prolonged for the six times from 97 to 2002 uh, for, you know, like about 15 years in the South and Southeastern provinces of the country. And coming to the 2010s or, you know, like more recent history of Turkey, uh, obviously after the failed coup attempt um, in July 2016, we have seen the, the announcement or establishment of, of another state of emergency, which was prolonged seven times and it lasted until uh, July 2018. 
And during this time, we know that the country was ruled by governmental decrees, which uh, kind of, you know, like expelled hundreds of thousands of people, shut down some associations, uh, some universities, uh, and the detainment um, duration was set up to 30 days. And also we had uh, a referendum, a constitutional referendum, which was held under the emergency rule in 2017. And according to the human rights associations, there were attacks, raids, and threats to, to in total 127 activities of the campaigning uh, opposition parties. And here is a graph that I wanted to show you, which is actually, you know, like showing us the severe impact of the state of emergency um, declarations on protest events. As you see here from this graph, it's like sharply declining um, the protests. Then we can talk about uh, the declaration of the martial law uh, and curfews, uh, which were, you know, like, again, employed in the 1970s, starting in 1971. And in the, in the 2010s, we have seen uh, the case of uh, curfews in again in the south and southeastern part of Turkey, which, according to some reports, impacted to around two million people in in uh, from 2015 till 2018. Uh, we can also talk about you know like postponing or banning strikes as a form of channeling. Um, and it happened, you know, like frequently in the 1970s and after the 1980 military coup, but we have seen that, uh, for example, like 17 strikes were banned under the AKP rules since 2002, and uh, seven of them were banned um, during the state of emergency rule, and actually Erdogan himself stated that uh, somehow, you know, like they are making use of the state of emergency to ban the strikes. And finally, I, I want to talk about country mobilization as a form of repression. In the 1970s, we had um, the idealist movement like the Grey Wolves, uh, which were the, the unofficial youth organization of the Nationalist, Nationalist Action Party in Turkey. And they constituted the right wing uh, counter mobilization to the left wing student movements. Um, and when we, you know, like look into the details of their, their form of repertoire, we are seeing that they also heavily resorted to violence. And coming to, to the aftermath of Gezi Park protest in 2013, we have seen that uh, the ruling UP party, they organized um, demonstrations under the name of respect to respect for the national will. Um, as Erdogan stated, a little bit earlier than organizing this, that they are having troubles in keeping the 50% uh, referring to their voter base uh, away from the streets. And in, during these um, respect for the national will, will rallies, if you look at the statements of Erdogan, you are going to see that, you know, like the Gezi Park protesters were labeled as vandals, barbars, uh, terrorists, and, you know, like a lot of other stuff, whereas um, the participants of these rallies were referred to as the real people, as in the, you know, like um, general rhetoric of populist leaders. So now, uh, after talking about like these um, two waves of protests, I would like to briefly talk about um, talk about like my other points um, because we we know that you know like um, or it, not we know that, but I'm I'm claiming that you know like populist authoritarian regimes are not only delegitimizing the civil society, but they're also trying to take over over the realm and. Um, in, I think it was in 2012, one of the leading um, people, the then leading peoples of AKP Burhan Kuzu stated that, stated in an interview that, you know, AKP uh, AK Party uh, was very successful in contaminating um, the judiciary, the military, but he said, you know, like the next is the streets, we need to take control of the street politics. So if you look at this graph, uh, which is showing some data again from the VDEM, um, Institute, we are seeing that uh, the mobilization for autocracy in Turkey has 
been uh, more than more than uh, the level of mass mobilizations in Turkey. So I I need to you know like dig deeper in this point, but I guess even this graph is telling us something here. And as you are probably aware of Turkey has been on the forefront of research on populism and authoritarianism lately, um, as the country's democracy has relapsed the most, according to Freedom House uh, data. And as we see uh, in, in the graphs here on the slides, um, since the AKP came to power in 2002, the Turkish democracy shrank, uh, especially with regards to the participatory and deliberative aspects. As a result, in 2018, the Freedom House changed the status of the country from partly free to not free for the first time since the military coup in 1980. So when we look to the literature, we are seeing that this democratic decline and change in politics and policies of Turkey under Erdogan and AKP rule uh, triggered attention to the topic, obviously. Uh, and several colleagues has written on the topic with an increasing attention, especially recently. So among the explanations uh, provided um, to explain this de-democratization process or democratic backsliding, again, whatever term you are using, are, um, are the centralization of the economic decision-making um, processes, then uh, redesigning the economy through informal institutions to reward uh, the supporters of the AKP and then punishing the opponents uh, using the market mechanisms. Some, some scholars claim that it happened because the AK party was trying to build up an authentic civilizational identity or, you know, like Muslim nation identity. And some other colleagues looked at to, to the outside powers saying that um, the the democratizing powers, I would like to say in quotation marks because it's not my uh, own uh, view, their leverage has declined and this caused the democratic decline in Turkey. And very recently, uh, Arslanov and Erkman, they actually looked at the contentious politics uh, aspect a little bit because, I mean, they focused on protest bans, which is only a specific form of repression, I would say, in trying to explain uh, authoritarianism. So I'm going to skip the slide. Um, and here again, we are seeing uh, some data from VDEM, uh, which I also found very interesting, showing us, you know, like the freedom of expression index in, in institutionalized autocracy, uh, mobilization for autocracy, and freedom of peaceful assembly. And it might seem a little bit, you know, like grief, this graph, but if you if you look, uh, you are going to see that um, the waves of mobilization for autocracy was actually followed by the pe periods of autocracy being institutionalized. So I'm going to, I don't know how much I, uh, how much I talked, but I'm going to uh, finish with this last slide. So uh, based on, you know, like what I'm trying to do and based on my only research and as well as you know like the research of other scholars and uh, data from varieties of democracy we can say that actually there is a continuity um, in rather than a rupture between different waves of protests in turkey especially with regards to the forms of protest and repression so this is maybe one of the reasons of uh, of the repressive culture that we can talk about Obviously, this is not to say that uh, this, these, these forms of repression are unique to Turkey. On the other hand, it's kind of, you know, like overlapping with the repressive mechanisms everywhere. Um, but maybe, you know, like um, because the country is no longer considered as a democracy uh, by some organizations or scholars, uh, we can say that um, the level of repression is higher in intensity. And um, yeah, I would also, you know, like bring this point of um, state-led counter mobilization being a form of repression, which is used to demobilize the opposition, which is um, used to legitimize the repression of the opposition and kind of, you know, like trying to breaking the opposition's mon monopoly on the streets in order to take over um, this realm. And finally, I can, uh, finish by saying that 
according to my point of view, contentious politics, um, the field of contentious politics and social movements is actually giving us a lot of, you know, like material to work on Turkey's authoritarian turn uh, to analyze and explain this authoritarian turn. Uh, and obviously we need more research on this. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bengi, for that uh, sweeping, uh, detailed, um, beautifully analytic <laughs> uh, survey of 50 years. Um, and good luck to Haider for, <laughs> for being able to now have a discussion, lead us off in the discussion before Professor Mogadam and I then, then turn it over to our, uh, our attendees. So um, Haider, please, um, if you will, take, take uh, the time you need and, um, and then we'll uh, open it up to discussion for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, Bengi's article also addresses some uh, problems of this uh, protest movement. Uh, you are not discussing much, but you address, so I will focus on that to provoke a discussion, I hope. Um, I will start uh, by repeating uh, your main points, um, that there is a continuity between the protest movements in the 70s um, and the recent protests, uh, Gezi protests. Uh, and that these movements uh, have been suppressed by multiple forms of state violence without generating structural change. Uh, and significantly, the failure of these protest movements has led to the uh, suspension of the law and the militarization of the state in both cases. Um, but doesn't this formulation reflect the trajectory of many of the protest movements that have proliferated you know, around the globe since the 60s? Uh, 1960s. Why indeed protest movements continue emerging everywhere in the world, despite the fact that they fail to um, fail to change political structures, even if in some cases they could change political regimes. I'll continue with a remark on Gezi protests, or rather um, the timing of Gezi protests. Uh, the protest began only two months after the announcement of the peace process between the PKK and Kurdistan Workers Party and the Turkish government following more than 30 years of armed conflict that claimed uh, tens of thousands of lives. Therefore, the timing of the protest, the Gezi protest, couldn't be worse for uh, the Kurds. It was the first time that the Turkish government had officially engaged in peace negotiations uh, with the Kurds, and that government was the target of a massive you know, uprising. My question is, um, and it is not a rhetorical question, is it incidental that one of the biggest uprisings in Turkish history took place only two months after the declaration of peace talks? Gezi protesters were so quick to recognize um, the Kurdish movement's ambivalent position. They criticized the Kurdish movement, or more precisely the Kurds, for not supporting their protest. This criticism then turned into a debate when the protesters posted on, um, posted on uh, Twitter the following question, where are the Kurds? Uh, this, this hashtag, where are the Kurds, quickly became a trending topic. Uh, another highly publicized news suggested that the police moved their water cannons from Kurdish cities to Istanbul to use them against the Gezi protesters. Now, ironically, um, Kurds have long been criticized for their violent resistance against the state, but all of a sudden the same Kurds were now criticized for collaborating with the state. Um, later on, um, some protesters, uh, mostly Kurdish, uh, which also means that the Kurds were really there in, in Gezi Park, I mean, uh, responded to that uh, popular question with another question. Where were, the Kur where were the Turks when the Turkish state massacred the Kurds? That was the question that was posed. This question was followed by many people sharing on social media the individual stories of Kurds who were killed by the Turkish military in the 90s. Uh, many Turkish protesters said they, uh, they said they just realized that they had been manipulated by uh, Turkish media for years, and therefore they had been completely unaware of what was happening in the Kurdish region. What was striking was that the protesters were eager to express how their political ideas have changed since the beginning of the Gezi protest. 
you know, it was the Gezi protest, they said, that made uh, possible their self-transformation. I'm doubtful about this discourse of you know, quick self-transformation. Uh, still though, the existence of this discourse, I believe indicates a desire on part of protesters to become otherwise. Or one can argue that the protesters indeed became otherwise within the communal life in Gezi Park where social relations were radically transformed. However, this form of political subjectivity was not sustainable. It was made possible by the suspension of existing social norms uh, and perhaps uh, paradoxically and more problematically um, uh, or problematically, it was also made possible by police violence. It was the presence of the police behind the barricades, the tear gas, uh, the tear gas coming from there um, and the fear of police operation to the park to Gezi Park, that generated a sense of collectivity. Thus, the political was still based on the distinction between friend and enemy, as Carl Schmitt has long ago argued, and maybe even reduced to the leader, you know, and the, the figure of Erdogan in America, Trump. Um, after the clearing uh, of Gezi Park and thus the communal life there, the protesters tried to revive that sensation of being otherwise, but with no success because there was no police there attacking. And, and there wasn't a communal life that built. Um, what could have happened if the police didn't evacuate the Gezi Park? Could the protest continue if the police didn't attack the protesters? Or if the, if the police didn't evacuate the park? As Etienne Balibar remarks, the temporal dimension of such protest movements is limited anyway. They are shortly, shortly by nature. And if this is the case, we cannot explain the failure of protest movements only by the fact of state violence. To the contrary, I mean, it is made possible by police and state violence. I want to ask if the movements of the 70s were different in terms of their temporal structure, given that such movements for the most part took place through formal party structures or, or labor-based or class-based organizational structures, um, in terms of uh, its organizational structure, the Gezi movement was based on um, horizontal networks of, or what they call horizontal, horizontal networks of solidarity. And the creation of horizontal networks of solidarity necess necessitated a perpetual mediatic um, presence. Indeed, media has become a natural, a natural um, a me a medium of um, an instrument of new social movements. However, and the absolute reliance on media generates unintended uh, negative consequences. Consider the question of visibility, for instance. It has been argued that in the era of digital circulation and social media, visibility is the benchmark of political effectivity. And the article cites an interesting statement about this, and I quote, while the majority of protesters uh, came from a lower class background, the high rate of participation within the middle and upper classes created the impression of a predominantly middle-class crowd. In addition, the middle classes had more control over the means of communication and could therefore represent uh, themselves as a greater force in the Gezi protest than they actually were. I certainly agree that the middle classes had more control over the means of communication, which made them more visible. But the question is not only, you know, that who, who had better control over the media. The entire uprising unfolded in a manner that could be posted on social media. The entire Gizdi Park was like a timeline, quite literally. The protesters have even printed some of their tweets that reveal their you know, disproportionate intelligence um, and hung them on uh, Gezi Park's wall. As one of the graffiti in Gezi Park read, the, uh, the revolution wouldn't be televised, it would be tweeted. It was truly a fetishistic moment. The copy surpassed the original, the timeline, the timeline surpassed the park. The act of protesting was at the same time an act of creating content for social media. What slogan you know, could, could collect more tweet, retweets? What kind of unusual uh, um, political action could attract more viewers on, 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 on social media? And the desire to maintain that mediatic presence turned the protest into what Rosalind Morris calls the theatrics of the streets. 
and political immediacy as its outcome. In turn, political immediacy reinforces a strategy of self-expression in the form of staging desire in the public space. And the problem is that this strategy attacks the subject and the notion of desire as uh, pre-ideological and pre-social. Um, you know, it is assumed that people don't learn what they want. They just want they, what they want naturally and authentically. But as Marx says, what people want is a question of ideology and desire is ideologically mediated. Um, the dismissal of the critic of ideology is also linked with the dismissal of the critic of political economy. The article shows well how the class paradigm has gradually disappeared in the discourses of the Turkish left. I found it very striking that even when there is a debate about um, the question of class, it refers to the, uh, to, to, to the degree to which uh, workers, actual workers participate in the protest. Ironically, as the article shows, even Marxist scholars confuse you know, labor, uh, labor as a as an abstract name of a, uh, of, a, of a structural position and actual workers. Um, you know, and the, the, the participation of workers doesn't necessarily bring a you know, critical political economy. My point is that protest movements are not interested in developing or even imagining a structure of representation that can be an instrument for socializing the surplus and thus transforming social relations as uh, Rosalind Morris argues. Instead, they seek to access media immediately, accomplish visibility, and display the illusion of pure democratic participation. It is the displacement of you know, representation by participation. Uh, returning uh, to the main argument of the article, is it continuity that we see in the history of social movements in Turkey, or is it just a repetition? Thank you. Thank you so much, Haider. Thank you very much. Um, Bengi, we'll let you respond, and then um, we'll have uh, Professor Mogadam uh, moderate. And I'll, let me just say uh, quickly to all the attendees, uh, please, you can start putting your questions in the Q&A um, if, if you want, because uh, after Bengi responds, uh, we, we want to move to you. Um, and just, again, a heads up, if you would like to um, uh, speak uh, and on, on video, so to speak, uh, just raise your hand, use the raise your hand function and my colleague, Allie, uh, Allison Hawkins, uh, will, um, will find a way to uh, turn you into a presenter <laughs> for that. Otherwise, just the Q&A function will be fine. Uh, so Bengi, um, let me turn it to you before we turn it back to Val. And thanks yeah. again. Thank you, Haidar, for these you know, like insightful comments. Um, you raised a lot of questions and I don't know where to start with, um, but I guess I'm going to pick up some points and then respond to them. Um, with regards to, you know, like problems of protest movements and if they are not, you know, like causing suspension of law and militarization of the state elsewhere, right? Uh, I'm not an expert on you know, like other countries, but we have this literature on social movements, especially the student movement of the 1960s um, in Italy and in, in Germany, which is, you know, like constituting to, to the more democratization of these states, maybe not immediately, but in the longer processes uh, by Sidney Taro, Della Porta, and, you know, like some other scholars who have written on this. With regards to your question, if it was, you know, like incidental that the Gezi Park protests started, you know, like two months after um, the initiation of, of the peace process, I don't know. I mean, I don't have an answer to this question because it would be a little bit speculative, I guess, to, to respond to that. But obviously there were a lot of, um, let me say one thing. Um, it is shown by some scholars that the Gezi Park protests um, became that mass, that crowded because of the um, police violence, right? And at that time, there were a lot of discussions um, and conflicts between the Gulenists and, and the AKP. And there were some comments in the media that these police who intervened in the um, in the protesters early that night, which caused, you know, like fury among the people might be Gulenists and they might have done this on purpose, but 
again, I cannot respond to this because this would be a little bit speculative from, from my perspective, but uh, recently I've been reading uh, Erdogan's speeches during these national, um, respect to the national will rallies. And it's striking because especially during those which he held in Anatolia, right? Like um, not in Istanbul and Ankara, but those in, in Kayseri, in Samsun and Erzurum, he's mentioning this actually. He's saying that, you know, um, maybe one of the aims of the Gezi Park protest was to um, blockage the, uh, the Kurdish peace process. And he's making a reference to this. Um, yeah, I guess this would, you know, like kind of answer your question about what could have happened if the police did not intervene. Um, again, this is a, you know, like, I guess, big debate in the literature, uh, what, what kind of, you know, like outcomes state repression has on, on protests. And there are some mixed results um, from the literature. Some claim that it is, you know, like, um, I mean, there are a lot of variables, right? Like the, the form of repression might have a different impact. The timing of repression might have a different impact. And it's, I guess, uh, really difficult to, um, to, to tackle it because like the, this is in recent history at least. But I, I definitely also believe that, you know, like at least that initial um, repression coming from the police to the peaceful protesters kind of, you know, like triggered that crowds to, to the streets. Uh, with regards to horizontal, horizontal versus, you know, like formal organizations, I, I agree with you. And this is, you know, like um, the whole literature again about the new social movements, not, you know, like theoretically maybe, but, you know, uh, with regards to the types of organizations. And I let me cl clarify that I'm not claiming that these waves of protests were similar or identical. Obviously, there are differences. Obviously, the 1970s had its unique um, setting and, and forms and, you know, like actors. And the Gezi Park has its um, unique setting and, you know, like um, actors and forms of protests. What I'm trying to tackle here is that, um, as claimed by some scholars in the literature, as well as in, in the media, treating Gezi Park protests as something really unique and, you know, like something totally different in, in, in the history of, in the political history of Turkey is actually kind of doing injustice to the previous uh, waves of protests. Because we know that, you know, like in the social movements literature, uh, we are talking about the spillover effects. We are talking about accumulation, right? All these protesters, they did not come out of the blue. Um, I have conducted research on the global justice movement or anti-globalization, alter-globalization movements in, 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 in Turkey in the early 2000s. And what was revealing that the political socialization of some of these actors were actually dating back to the 1970s. So what I'm trying to tackle is that these connections between um, different waves of connect, uh, protests rather than claiming that they are identical um, in some aspects. Uh, yeah, uh, and I would like to, with regards to this question, which is very interesting, is it continuity or repetition? I need to think more. Um, but with regards to your comment about, you know, like the protesters seeking attention, um, seeking access to media immediately, actually there are scholars like I think it was called months. He claims that um, a protest can be accepted as not happened if it is not represented in the media, because you are not, you know, like um, able to distribute your um, demands, your grievances to the wider public. So I'm going to uh, say it there and stop here. Thanks for for your comments. Thank you, Bengi, for responding to those. Um, so we turn it over, uh, Val, I'll turn it over to you to, to take it from here. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be part of this and to have listened to um, Bill Gay's uh, fascinating uh, discussion and also um, the challenge from uh, Haydar. Um, and uh, before we get to questions, the Q&A, I wonder if I may actually 
um, uh, make a statement and or pose a few questions. Um, uh, first, I want to say that Bill Gay's um, presentation is really fascinating and I'm very much looking forward to your book um, because uh, you and I work on uh, you know, similar uh, topics and, um, uh, and I very much like the way you have approached uh, the subject matter um, comparing and contrasting the protest waves from the 1970s uh, to today um, using uh, the concepts and categories of social movement theorizing. Um, political opportunity um, and uh, contentious uh, politics and so on. Um, and um, I, I, I wanted to start just by making a point about your use of the term social movement uh, society. And of course, there are scholars, Hank Johnston and others, who have argued that, um, for example, the United States is a social movement society mm -hmm. because movements are normalized. You know, I have actually taken issue with that concept myself because, uh, and in my book, Globalization and Social Movement, the most recent um, edition, because I feel that even in the bourgeois democracy, so to speak, um, the state really cannot countenance those so social movements in particular that pose a challenge to the authority of the state. And so time and again, we will see these liberal democracies, these bourgeois democracies actually attacking protesters. So I'm not actually um, a fan of the concept of um, social movement society being characteristic of liberal bourgeois uh, democracies and the other third world countries you know, are not um, uh, enjoying uh, such a status. So that's just one simple point that I wanted to, to make that um, you know, ultimately there is an authoritarian strain in the bourgeois democracies as well as we have seen time and again, most recently you know, uh, in the United States, but also with the uh, French police and Gilets jaunes and so on. Yeah, I was just going to say that France is also an important case in that regard. Exactly. So uh, I just wanted to make that point. But um, I did um, uh, very much um, like the way you have posed this, uh, you know, issue of um, uh, the way both the 70s protesters and the protesters in Gezi Park and afterwards how they have used similar forms of collective action repertoire. So their a collective action repertoire is very similar. And by the way, there is a kind of a global diffusion of some of these forms of uh, collective action too, um, such as the occupation of space, whether it was universities in the 1960s and 70s or it's parks and squares today. Um, but it also includes um, something that Haydad criticized, and that's theatrics. Um, we find actually that the um, various forms of theater and performance always plays a role, um, perhaps more so today than perhaps in the 60s and 70s. Although when I think back about some of the 1968 protests in Europe, um, I think that some of them did also involve some uh, form of street theatrics. Um, so I, I wouldn't uh, use this as a critique of contemporary movements. I have another critique of uh, contemporary movements, which is a little bit closer to Haydar's, but theatrics is not really one of them. I just think that um, uh, theatrical performances are such an ingrained part and parcel of uh, collective action repertoires that, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense to really criticize them and say that they are central to any particular uh, form. Um, there is, however, a huge difference between the protest wave of the 1960s and 70s and that of today, where, which I think, Bill Gay, you didn't mention very much. Um, you mentioned one of them, and that is the um, uh, the huge presence of women. Um, and I have written about that too, that although women were involved in the 1960s and 70s in the protests, in the guerrilla movements, in Turkey, in Iran, in other countries, um, not as massively as today. It's really in the new century that we see this huge participation of women. And that has to do with various things, these structural, secular changes in the characteristics of the female population, education, employment, uh, cultural changes and so on. But something that was missing in your talk 
is um, another very key difference is the fact of the wreckage of the left. So the left socialist communists were very, very active in the 60s and 70s. And uh, the, our more recent protests are really revealing of the absence of um, a genuinely coordinated and centralized left. In other words, we no longer have the party and, and the party has been um, replaced by these horizontal leaderless diffuse disparate movements which come and go and it is not clear that they have the capacity to engage in the sorts of broad social transformation that Haydad was alluding to or that you know I've written about also in, uh, in my book. And I think that that is a very important distinction between the early wave that you mentioned and, um, and the contemporary um, wave. And um, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see how you might approach this. Um, thank you, Professor um, Okadam. These are, you know, like really, um, really important points. And um, let, me, let me go back here. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you about the concept of movement society, but I just, you know, like used it to to differentiate uh, Turkey in that sense with those claim to be movement societies, because as you know, like in, in France, we have seen like various instances of police brutally attacking the protesters. And this was even actually, you know, like, and, and the, the recent protest wave here in the US, these were even moments that that were criticized by Erdogan himself, so ironically, right? So um, that that's you are right. Like it's kind of you know like making this distinction between the backwards countries uh, versus you know like the liberal um, you know like more free countries. And yeah, I, I need to be careful with using that. Huge presence of women. Thanks, thanks for bringing that. Oh, because it's really striking, actually, uh, in the night when we look at the 1970s in Turkey, obviously women are there, but they are, you know, like kept behind because it's, you know, like the men who are the charismatic leaders of, of the movements uh, and women are there just maybe to uh, to act as um, as the followers, so to speak. And it is striking in the case of Turkey because after um, the, the 1918 military coup, uh, when, um, when there was a transition to the civilian rule in 1983, the women's movement started to uh, flourish. And I some, sometimes, you know, like I haven't thought about this deeply, but I sometimes feel like maybe it was, um, you know, like since most of the main cadres of these movements were imprisoned, uh, they were exiled, you know, like the, the human resource of that part, that movements were not there. So maybe, you know, like the women finally um, find their moment to, to be there, to be present, or, you know, like they were at least not um, curtained by, by the men. And again, true, like considering um, what's going on in Turkey right now, I'd say that uh, the women's movement is one of the most powerful um, social movements in Turkey, I would say. Um, what's it called? Like there, there were all these debates about the Istanbul Convention. Yes. And thanks to, thanks to the women's movement, the government had to step back from, from that. And I really think that uh, that's, that's very important. And yes, with regards to the forms of organization, no party being, and you know, like movements taking this less um, uh, structured way of protesting, I guess some of them are doing this on purpose because they feel like, you know, like today they can attract more people by doing so. Um, especially, you know, like with the festive activities, festive forms of protests of the anti-globalization movement, I guess they attracted a lot more attention than they would be able to do um, in back in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah. Oh, one, one last thing that I wanted to, um, to ask you about, um, and that uh, came to mind as Haydad was speaking, um, were any of the art, um, the Kurdish protests over time. Have you integrated those into your data set? Um, in my data set for the 1970s is actually, you know, like 
having some Kurdish protests. But back in the 1970s, at least for a while, um, the Kurds were a part of the larger left-wing um, groups. So they were not really, since I'm based, I'm using, you know, like newspaper archives, I was not able to detect um, that aspect. But we are seeing it, especially after the 1980 military coup, uh, when they are distinguishing themselves. But for, for the most part of the 1970s, they are with the, within the larger left-wing groups. Okay, so they are. Out of respect for our um, attendees, can I, can I move us over? We have one question now, and I hope if we ask this question, maybe we'll get more questions from attendees, so. Yeah, yeah, let me just point out. Yeah, excellent presentation from Melinda uh, Negron Gonzalez. Excellent presentation. This is beyond the scope of your talk, but would you say that protest in Turkey is generally not an effective way to promote change for any social group, not just leftists, during these two protest waves? Hmm. Protest is not um, an effective way to um, to promote change. I, I guess it all. I mean, <clears throat> I can answer this question in this way. Uh, it depends on you know, like what you define as change. Um, because especially with regards to you know, like the literature with regarding the revolution, for example, right? There are some definitions of revolution which would um, definitely refer to an overthrowing of a, of a government. But on the other hand, there are some scholars who define revolution as some sort of, you know, like changes in, uh, in the social structures. And again, this is um, based on how you define change. Uh, but I, I don't know. Uh, with regards to, yeah, obviously, you know, like these back in the 1970s and the Gezi Park protest, maybe, especially in the 1970s, it didn't bring a lot of change, right? Like structural change. Uh, in the Gezi Park case, they were at least um, tried to, they were at least successful in making the government step back at least for a while. Um, yeah, so it depends on what you define change. If you are talking about big structural changes, of course, protests doesn't seem to be the best um, best tool. Can I just point out? There isn't another question. Um, Zeynep Tufekci um, mm -hmm. has, uh, you know, written a um, uh, a book on um, on uh, protests and Twitter feeds and so on, um, and she has a critique of the Gezi Park protests. Uh, whereby she points out that in the absence of any kind of coordinated um, uh, or uh, movement or organizing, um, there were no spokespersons who were able to negotiate when the government was sort of willing to do so, or uh, some of it officials were willing to do so. So would you, um, would you agree with her critique of the Gezi Park? protests in that respect. So it's not the protest per se that she is criticizing, but the way they were organized or the lack thereof of organization and coordination. Uh, definitely. And I guess uh, Gonja Sonmas Pool has, uh, has a question in relation to this, if you don't mind me, you know, like picking up on that as well. Oh, that's in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would like the two presenters to express their views in relation to how united or disunited the Gezi protests actually were uh, beyond that particular mood in Turkey and how this became more apparent in the following years in Turkey. Yeah, I guess, you know, like your question and Gonja's question are quite overlapping. So this is why I wanted to pick up on that. And I totally agree because this is why I'm not, for example, defining the Gezi protest as a Gezi movement, Gezi Park movement, because when we look at the literature, there are some scholars who claim that it was a movement. But from my perspective, it was a wave of protest bringing together, you know, like various movements. Because when you look at the structure, especially the political structure um, of the Gezi Park protesters, you are seeing people from, uh, from Islamists uh, who are claiming themselves to be anti-capitalists. You are seeing the secular Kemalists. Uh, you are seeing, um, you know, like, um, some Kurdish people, you are seeing Alevis. 
So there are a lot of, you know, like groups coming together. And, and in some cases, especially if you look at the, some, you know, like striking pictures from the protest, you would see uh, even some, um, you know, like far right idealist symbols that are uh, used during the protest. So it was kind of a, you know, like um, moment where all these, where all the fury of all these different groups came together. And obviously it didn't lead anything, you know, like any, any big structural change because it was not a movement. If you would ask them probably, you know, like the main, the most common thing was to ask for the resignation of the government. But apart from that, they did not have any anything in, in common. They wouldn't know how to proceed if, right. if the government has um, resigned. Right. And in, in, in response to Zeynep right. Tufekci's comment, that's the same, right? They, Taksim solidarity appeared to be the, you know, like the council representing um, the the movement, but it was it was not. It was just one group. Yeah, no strategy. Yeah. Can I just pose? Oh, unless Hey Dad wants to weigh in on that question too. Only I can say that when many groups, like many different groups, when they get together and and um, you know in a protest. They can agree only, you know, one thing that they don't, you know, they criticize the government that, or they are against the president or something. They can't go beyond, um, you know, they can't come up with a program or anything. They just, you know, unite against the government. And then when that happens, usually, and one of the groups took over, you know, take over. Uh, it happened in Egypt and other places. So um, I don't think there is any, you know, prospect uh, of such. Um, diverse groups, but that's the, the same point, right? Like because it's diverse, because there are different groups, because all these different groups can express themselves, and it's already, you know, we think it's that's enough, right? That's the point. We don't need any uh, transformation. Well, in principle, there could be coalition building, which, for example, happened in um, the United States in the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movement, but you know. Um, there was a strategy then, but not really a strategy here. Uh, one last question for um, uh, for um, uh, a bit. Uh, I don't. Uh, no, for for Bengi actually um, is actually it's my question. Sorry. Um, I know. Is there what is the significance of the fact that uh, some seventy eight percent of those who were detained um, in the Gezi Park protest were Alevis? Is there any significance to that? Um, I I think it was quite striking in, in that regard um, because it's it might show I don't know you know like I don't have the data on that but it might show some targeted rep repression uh, because it's not saying that the se um, seventy six percent of the protesters were Alevis but those who were detained were Alevis right so it might show some targeted uh, repression. Um, yeah, and and Alevi is you know like ge generally known as to be um, left wing, um, you know, left wing secular without head scarves and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, beards, etc. Yeah, thanks. That was fascinating. Um, we do have a. Um, uh, I have a question for you both, Haider and, and Bengi. Uh, if people would like to follow up with you in some way, would you? Um, I, I can't remember if we put your emails on our website, but uh, you, maybe you can either put them into the, put chat in the chat right now. Yeah. I'm sorry, put them in the chat and share it. Um, there's a there's a comment from someone to Haidar. Thanks for the interesting presentations and the comments. I would love to hear Haidar's answers to some of his own questions. Basically, <laughs> I agree with some of his observations. So maybe that person can follow up with you on an email um, and or just publish it, and then we'll all appreciate. Uh, answers to your own questions. So there's Haidar's email coming to everyone um, and Bengis as well. Um, folks, everyone who's been uh, attending and, and not queuing and aing with, uh, with us, but, uh, but enjoying the presentation with us, uh, we will also be able to share a recording of this, uh, hopefully by next week. Um, you can just email Allison Hawkins 
uh, or myself, um, both at Northeastern, and we'll be happy to send you those links. They'll also be on our BCARS website, the Boston Consortium for Arab Region Studies. Cheap plug, please go to Boston Consortium for Arab Region Studies, bcars-global.org, and sign up for our newsletter. There's Allie's email as well. You can just write to her and she'll add you to our distribution list. I can't thank you, Bengi and Haider enough. Uh, and of course, Val um, uh, and behind the scenes, Ali and, uh, and other folks. Um, thank you all of you for coordinating this. Thank you to our um, attendees, uh, as I say, especially at this time in our lives uh, and in 2020. So Bengi, I, everybody, everybody is applauding you and Haider and Val. Thank you as well Val, for wonderful moderating. Um, Thanks for thank you all. having us and organizing this, actually. Thanks oh, so much. Our, our pleasure. There'll be more of these. Um, my friend, uh, Sarah Roy, I think if she's still on there, she'll be organizing one uh, in the spring. Also, uh, I've agreed to work with her in any way I, I can be helpful to her. So the Center for Middle East Studies at Harvard, I know, is going to be doing something uh, also uh, with other speakers. And we'll be distributing that also on our website uh, come spring and a lot more in between then and now. So thank you all um, and uh, good luck to everyone next week, wherever you may be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, next week. Bye everybody. Well, thank you, Bengi. Thank you, thank you. Very much.